Hello, and welcome to the Family Histories Podcast, the show for and about those of us who are sat quietly in libraries, archives, and spare rooms all around the world, tirelessly piecing together our collective social and family history. My name is Andrew Martin, I'm a family historian, and I'll be your host. In this episode, The Reunited, we'll be hearing about how my guest's research led him to reunite his mother with her biological father, and we're trying to find the real identity of the father of a 19th century woman in London. So, put down that old diary, grab a cuppa, and let's meet our guest. My guest today is a professional genealogist who is also an avid old postcard and photograph collector who then uses his research skills to trace the lives behind them. As if that's not enough, his research into local war memorials has led him to become an author and a cemetery tour guide. So, with this final episode of Series 4, my guest is last, and last, but by no means least. It's Simon Last. Hello Simon, welcome to the Family Histories Podcast. Hello Andrew, thank you for inviting me. You are very welcome. I get the impression that with family history, local history and military history, that all keeps you very busy. Uh, Yes, uh, I don't like to be bored and I'm always very busy. Um, (laughs) So, uh, yeah, I use my family history in as many different ways as I can. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's step back and let's find out what it was that got you interested in this wonderful pastime of researching family history. I got into family history, which I'll explain a bit later on, um, because my mum was adopted and I helped her do research about 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we had a successful outcome and my love of genealogy has just grown from there, really. Okay. Where did you start with with your research? Because adoption cases would be quite difficult, I would have thought, to research. It was quite difficult. My mum had already tried previously to find information about her father, mm-hmm. um, and she had limited information that she was given from the Thomas Coram Foundation in London, yeah. where she was adopted from. Okay. And 20, 25 years ago, the internet was coming along, and I said, give me the information that you've got, and looked for clues, and... Uh, Using those clues, I made a breakthrough. Were there any other relatives that you could maybe lean upon for documents or memories or advice? Uh, Not not really. It was really only the information that my mum had from the um, home where she was adopted and um, family stories that she'd been told growing up. She'd always known that she was adopted, so she had a limited amount of information. Mm -hmm. um, And it was building on that to see what else we could find out. Okay, so what kind of places have you looked for maybe maybe not your mother's side um of your of your family tree but what else have you have you used to research the other parts of your family tree i've used obviously i'm going to go on to explain a bit later that my grandfather was polish so i've used um polish genealogists and contacts in those countries sure and also like military military of defense records i'm just trying to find out if my grandfather served for poland in world war Two. A wide resource, um, really, of research avenues that I've used and old newspapers. um, Mm -hmm. And really, that's why I got into old postcards and documents, because sometimes you've got a family document that might have a clue or a name that leads you on to to expand that research. Okay. Was collecting old postcards and photographs kind of a conscious decision or did it just accidentally happen? It it accidentally happened. My dad had some old photographs to do with his side of the family tree. Okay. And once I was putting the family tree together, different areas came up and we had photos with no names or clues, but suddenly we had a family that was living in an area in Bedfordshire, which was the photographer on one of the photos that we had. So through that, we were able to piece together the lady in the photo. She had five children. There was five children in the photo. Mm -hmm. So it was using the the details on the photograph and matching those up to the family tree research. And another reason for doing that is a lot of times people say to me, oh, I don't have much information to get my family tree started. Okay. But by using a name and address or something on an old postcard or letter, it's amazing how much information you can discover and put a family tree together. Yeah. And I think people are often quite surprised um, 
I, I blog about the postcards and old photos that I research and people are quite often surprised and come back to me and say, can't believe you found all that information from one document or or card, etc. So um, yeah, it, it's quite uh, heartbreaking when I've been to places that well, antique shops uh, or kind of kind of antique shops where you go in there and you see these once much loved photographs and these once cherished postcards and they're just all in boxes there and they're just sat waiting for I don't know who and I always have a quick flick through to see if there's any with names or anything identifying on the back I've never spotted one that I've thought actually I can take this and try and research who this is is that where you generally get uh, your postcards and photographs from yeah um old um, um, antique shops, secondhand shops, Mm -hmm. but I've also taken before COVID and starting again now, visiting postcard fairs. Okay. um, Because you go to a postcard fair and a dealer will have all the postcards out in topographical boxes, etc. But they'll often have a social history box of weddings and children and going through those, looking for a place or a name or a date. And having been to a few fairs, I've got to know a few of the dealers now and telling them what I'm trying to do. And they're often quite interested as well to know that those photos might possibly be reunited with the original family. Yeah. And some of those that I have reunited, when someone comes back to you and says, oh, that's a relative in my tree and I've never seen a photo before, it's uh, it, it's, it's lovely. It's um, I bet. just for a bit of research, but you've opened up a new avenue, I say, and a picture for someone that they've never seen. So it's uh, quite rewarding at the same time. Yeah, that that must be quite a surprise for them. Do you tend to find them or do they tend to find you? Sometimes, as I say, I I blog about the research that I do. So people will put names into the internet and it will link to my blog post. Mm -hmm. But I have also used Ancestry where I've gone in to see if anybody's got a tree with that person in and sent them a message and reunited some that way as well. Well, I look forward to getting a message from you on Ancestry. (laughs) (laughs) Fingers crossed. (laughs) I've actually had it work the other way for me that somebody does the same thing with old photos and they post them regularly. Yeah. And a couple of years ago, they posted an old wedding photo and I knew straight away it was a match to some that I already had in my own family tree. Oh, wow. And I hadn't seen that particular image before. So uh, I know how I felt when yeah. I suddenly saw that picture relating to my family. So, Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so aside from old photographs and postcards, you also have a penchant for war memorials as well what what can you tell me about that I sort of fell into the war memorial research really um okay I did a postgraduate certificate in genealogy at Strathclyde University and we had to do a project as part of that course and I decided to research um 10 names on a war memorial in Suffolk where I grew up Mm -hmm. um did an article for the local town magazine about those 10 names And then the town council approached me and said, oh, it's an anniversary coming up of the war memorial. Would you research all the names on the memorial? Okay. And from that, I put a book together and uh, sold that book and then did a World War II book and uh, sold those to raise funds for the Royal British Legion. Oh, okay. So it's just developed developed from that, really. Yeah. Was it fairly easy to, to research the names on the memorial or were there a few that were just really hard? Some of them were difficult because actually some of the names had actually been spelt wrong or they had the wrong initials. Oh. And there were some names missing from the memorial. Oops. So over a period of time and piecing it all together and the town of Framlingham in Suffolk is quite a close-knit community. So a lot of people knew Mm -hmm. families going back in time. So it was able to, I was able to piece it all together. Yeah. Um. But it was interesting. And the World War I names in some ways were easier than the World War II names because there are more World War I records available online. Yeah. It's the World War II ones. Thankfully, there were less names, but they were a bit more difficult to research. But then again, there was more rel- more people still alive and relatives that remembered those people. So it worked in a slightly different way. Did you have to learn lots of military terms and lots of different military documents to be able to research this? Or had you kind of amassed an amount of military history knowledge before you started this? What I did when I started the research for the book, I actually became a member of our local branch of the Western Front Association. Okay. Um, so they meet on a monthly basis and have mm-hmm. a speaker every month to talk about 
issues and stories relating to World War One. Yeah. Um, and I actually joined them when I started the research back in 2012, and I'm still a member, and I'm now the treasurer for the branch. So, uh, oh, okay. so over the time and using other members, yeah. I was able to ask them about terminology and things about battles that I may not know, or we might have had to talk about something. So, over time, it has. My knowledge has developed. That's good. Um, I believe that you also do or have run a one place study and a one name study. Yeah, I run a, a one place study for Parham, a little village in Suffolk, which is where my paternal ancestors come from. Okay. And then also a one name study for my surname Last. Mm -hmm. And I have um, Facebook groups and things for those um, that keeps me quite busy and links people up and uh a few years ago, I actually had a get together in Parham, in the village, in the village hall of anybody that was researching the the surname, and they could bring documents and photos along. I need to do more on it, but it's like everybody; it's having enough time to do everything that you want to do and work as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Does your last surname overlap with Parham? So, are they kind of together in the records? Yes. Yeah, so, the last surname, my my paternal ancestors, all originate from that from that village okay. and I also linked to my World War One research I actually did a, a project where I looked at all the men with the surname last that died in World War One mm -hmm. for the Guild of One Name Studies and a lot of those men even though when they died they were living in other places a lot of the last people originated from Suffolk so it's a very much Suffolk surname so uh, oh, okay so that was quite an interesting project to look at all those and the families and how they intertwined etc it must kind of i guess distract you if you're doing the one place study a one name study the postcards and photographs and your professional genealogist and you're doing your own research as well i, do, I just don't know how you can possibly fit all of that in uh, I do wonder sometimes myself. Uh, <laughs> I, I, when I started doing paid genealogy work, it was a part-time um, business. Okay. But in the last few years, I've actually gone full-time doing that and now have a little office. Yeah. So obviously, I have some weeks which are good with client work. Then it goes a little bit quieter and I can pick up the other bits of research that I like to do. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm quite lucky, really, with my time now compared yeah. to five, six years ago. Yeah. I've seen you tweeting uh, your window displays from your uh, physical office in Southend-on-Sea, I think is correct? That's right. Yes, I actually moved into an office um, last September mm -hmm. and it's a ground floor office which um, actually had a, a shop front window. Okay. And I decided that if I could have something in the window yep. to do displays about genealogy so I could link into Remembrance Week and other events going on. Yep. It might attract other people. And it's been quite interesting that people knock on the door and go, oh, genealogy, is that like the program? Who do you think you are? <laughs> um, and there's a school around the corner. And when the children walk past, they look in the window. So it's just trying to raise that profile and awareness of what genealogy and family history is and what we can do to help people to find out more information. Yeah. No, I, I was quite intrigued that you'd actually set up a a physical office because I don't think I know any other professional genealogists who are doing a physical location instead of a virtual office so that must have been quite a big big step it was a big step I was quite lucky with the premises that I'm in and I say then quite a, a good location mm. and and I've always been quite lucky picking up client work but quite often it's clients from overseas so you don't get to meet them sure. but having had the shop front and people knocking on the door and having open days I've actually picked up more local work where people actually come in and have a chat bring documents in and I like that mix now of hands-on research as well as those more distant clients, I suppose. It's um, yeah. I, I find I found that sometimes when it was just emails and online, you just lost something sometimes in that work. Um, so it's nice to have that mix, really. Uh, what was it that inspired you to actually be a professional genealogist? It's really just a hobby that's just developed. I say I had okay. had a successful outcome with the adoption research. Um, and I enjoyed it, started helping other people, then did my qualification. And it's just grown from there, really. And it's just something that I really enjoy. And clients pay you for doing work. But when you enjoy it, it's not like work in a way. It's um, it's totally different. It's kind of a paid holiday. Yeah. But, it's, but when there's deadlines and invoices, um, they're the two 
from my point of view, they're the two boring bits. Yes. Uh, yeah. The, then it feels less of a holiday, I'm sure. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, you also volunteer for the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. What kind of work do you do for them? Yes, so recently, this um, earlier this year, somebody at my Western Front Association branch said that um, Commonwealth War Graves were looking for a volunteer tour guide for Sutton Road Cemetery, which is a big cemetery in South End, which has got nearly 300 burials. Mm -hmm. And um, they said, would I be interested? So I looked at the details and made an application, had an interview and was accepted. And so far, I've done four one-hour tours of of, uh, Sutton Road Cemetery, just picking out some of the headstones and the graves and the stories of why the men, and we've got two women as well, buried in the the cemetery. Mm -hmm. Um, As a lot of people just think that any military graves are going to be overseas. They don't necessarily think they'll have them on their own doorstep. Yeah. And being South End on Sea, we had some big hotels that were used as military hospitals in World War I. So some of the casualties would come back from the front line, sadly die at those hospitals and ended up being buried in the cemeteries here. So there's been yeah. some really interesting stories. And um, I've had a really good mix of people and age groups that have come along on those tours so far. Although, you know, it's great to give something back and yeah. it's voluntary, but also it might lead on to other people contacting me about other research or passing my name on. So it's um, worth doing that yeah, and uh, giving something back, really. Yeah, absolutely. Do you think that the people who attend are people who are interested in military history or do you think that there may be people who have relatives who are in that cemetery and they're kind of interested from that point of view? It's a real mix, really. Some people have got relatives buried in the cemetery and they've seen the war graves and Mm -hmm. are interested to find out more. Some people had never been to the cemetery before and then saw the tour as advertised. And I say it's been a real mix down to like, I think the youngest was about 12, right up to somebody in their late 80s. So it's been a real mix of age groups and people just interested in finding more out about what's in their local area. And people have come on the next ones who've been recommended and told about it by the, somebody that came on a previous one. So it's That's good. So that's, that's, that's good. Yeah, definitely. Um, What do you think is the most exciting part of uh, researching family history? Uh, For me, linked to the postcard and old photo research, I love it when I get a message and it's somebody from that family tree who hasn't seen that photo before. To me, that's... um, That means a lot, really, because like we, we, we both said, if we had someone contact us about a photo in our family tree, we know how we would feel. So I find that the most rewarding part. Yeah. Um, and then also the war memorial research, having done the Framlingham World War One and World War Two books back in 2012 and 2014, I raised over a thousand pounds for the Royal British Legion. Oh, wow. Which through research and compiling a book was a fantastic outcome. So I was really pleased about that as well. When people knew you were writing a book, did they kind of come out of the woodwork with information or were they just curiously waiting for to find out what you'd written? Uh, no, I had um, quite a lot of people liaise with me during the research stages saying they've got photos or information. and okay. So it all worked quite well. And from that, I went on to do another book about the Albra War Memorial in Suffolk. Mm -hmm. And that only came about because a lady had seen something in the newspaper about the Framlingham books. Okay. And um, so other projects have developed out of it. So it's been worthwhile doing it. It's now that part of the show where my guest picks one of their most fascinatingly good, bad or just plain ugly relatives, and then they tell their life story. Okay, Simon, who are you going to introduce us to? I'm going to go on to talk a bit more about my um, Polish grandfather, who I mentioned in the introduction. Okay. So as previously mentioned, my mum was adopted back in 1949. And um, about 20, 25 years ago, she wanted to try and find out more information about her birth father, if she could. I mean, like a lot of adopted children, she didn't really want to do much about it while her adopted parents were still alive. Sure. So she'd already tried writing some letters to find some information about him, but hadn't had any success. The internet was coming along and uh, I said, give me the information that you have and I'll see 
if I can take it any further for you. So we had some very basic information about her father and his name. And his name was Tadeusz Bielosevich. And in the few details that we had, it mentioned that he possibly had a brother that had gone to Canada and a few other details. Okay. But I latched onto the Canadian link and went onto the internet looking for anybody with the surname Bielosevich in Canada and phone directories and things online. Mm -hmm. And I actually found um, somebody with that surname in Canada and I decided to write a letter to that person from the address and information that was on the directory. I wrote quite a, a basic letter, not really saying what I was looking for, that only that I was trying to trace somebody with the same surname, sent off that letter thinking that I probably wouldn't hear anything. And I don't think it was even 10 days later, Mm -hmm. I got home from work one afternoon and there was a message on the home answer phone and it was from a Polish gentleman. Wow. (laughs) So I listened to the message and uh, this Polish gentleman said, oh, I've been contacted by my brother in Canada who says that you're trying to find somebody with the same surname. What's it all about? Please, can you contact me? Okay. Obviously... I'd hoped I would have success, but I didn't know how quickly I would have any results or feedback. That is quick. So I was a little bit, yeah, that was very quick. So I was a little bit unsure how to proceed because I didn't know how much information this gentleman may or may not know. So I tried to speak to somebody else to just get some ideas of what I could say. And I rang somebody and they said, I'm just doing something. I'll ring you back in five minutes. Oh, The phone rang back in five minutes and I picked it up, but it wasn't the person I was waiting for. It was actually this Polish gentleman ringing back again. Oh, gosh. (laughs) Okay. So I actually had to think on my feet and uh, I I said to this gentleman, um, I said, I'm looking for my grandfather. And he asked me questions about my mum and when she was born, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. and um, after what seemed long gaps to each question, which probably weren't, <laughs> he finally said, yes, that's my daughter. Oh, wow. So I'd actually spoken to my granddad for the first time. Oh, wow. And he was living in Bristol, and uh, he, he living here in the UK in Bristol, and his brother in Canada had contacted him to say that somebody was looking for him. Oh, okay. So... Um, Obviously, it was uh, one of those wow moments. And I obviously took some details from him and hung up the phone. But then I needed to contact my mum, who actually lives up in Suffolk. I'm down in Essex. So it wasn't a case of just popping around the corner. Yeah. And actually to speak to her to say that I'd found her father. She was at work, but I got hold of her later on. And what I actually did later on that afternoon, I got in the car drove up to Suffolk a couple of hours away, sat with her and we rang Tadius, my granddad, and she spoke to him while I was with her. Wow. Because it was one of those things that I wanted to be there when she spoke to him for the first time. Yeah, of course. And yeah. So that was uh oh, wow. That was the power of the internet. <laughs> yeah. I mean finding the link in Canada. Yeah. I mean I can't imagine what that feels like. And I can't imagine where you'd start. I mean, what, what do you say first? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, like I say, I was really unsure what to say to Taddeus. Yeah. I didn't even know if he knew about my mother. Yeah, oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, but he did know about my mum. And um, okay. he'd uh, obviously, when he came to England after World War II, he was a Polish soldier that was sent to like different, there was different resettlement camps in the country. Mm-hmm. And he was sent to one in Hawarden in North Wales. Right. Okay. And he met a girl and they had a relationship. Mm-hmm. And my mum was a result of that relationship. But they were actually together for a few months. Yeah. But being a foreign soldier in England and her parents from a small village in North Wales, obviously circumstances were different at that time. And yeah. my grandmother had to give up my mother. And as I mentioned in the introduction, my mum was actually adopted through the Thomas Gorham Foundation in London, which is the original Foundling Hospital in Brunswick Square. Oh, okay. So again, a few years after finding my grandfather, I actually contacted the Thomas Gorham Foundation and they were able, with one of their senior social workers or workers within the organisation, put together all the notes and they invited my mum and myself up Mm -hmm. to the Thomas Gorham Foundation and they were actually able to give us the whole story of my mum being taken to the home, the situation, the circumstances. 
and there was a lot more to the story than my mum had ever known. And my grandfather had wanted to stand by my grandmother, wow. but it was circumstances and family and things. Mm -hmm. And I know how much that meant to my mum, mm -hmm. knowing the full story and all the true details. And sadly, my mum's unwell now, but I'm so glad that I was able to do that for her and I will treasure that. Yeah. And moving on with the Polish links, my grandfather Tadius had remarried mm -hmm. and he'd had two daughters and yeah. a son. And when we met one of my mum's half sisters and she walked into the room, it was like my mum walking into the room, even though they'd never even met each other. And I know people say that all the time and you see it on Long Lost Family, but okay. the mannerisms and similarities were amazing. It was just spooky to be honest and uh <laughs> she'd got her dad's genes yes yeah <laughs> <laughs> and uh and then move moving on from that a few years later we actually went over to Gdansk in Poland okay so we took my granddad Tadius and my mum and dad and my brother and we went to Gdansk and met a cousin of my mm -hmm. um granddad's in Gdansk mm -hmm. and she invited us to her apartment for lunch yeah And we walked into this apartment and on the wall was all these black and white photographs on the wall. And suddenly there was all different relatives and people that we'd never seen. And they were telling us how this one fitted in and that one fitted in. And it was just, it was just an amazing outcome and um, very treasured memories. And so to be able to do that for my mum was fantastic. That feels maybe a little bit overwhelming if there's all of these people who are who are desperately wanting to meet or or see you to have to yes cope with with meeting them all anyway and then and also for them to also actually be your family as well yeah no it was quite a, quite overwhelming and trying to fit it all together and over time I have written notes and written things down to try and put some chronological order to how everybody fits in and what happened and it's only now looking back yeah. Again, you really realise the impact of what, what you did at that time. It's with hindsight and looking back and realise how much we did. And also, I was able to find out quite a bit of information for my grandfather, Tadius. Records to do with World War II, because okay. his family were deported to Siberia in World War II. And sadly, his mother died. And uh, his brother ended up in Canada and his sister in America. Mm -hmm. But I was able to actually find some other information for my granddad about the time before he came to England, which he'd never known as well. So that that was fantastic. And we also did another trip to Poland where we hired a Polish genealogist who did some research before we went. <laughs> and we had three days going around villages and churches and places that the family had lived. Wow. And we actually went over the border into Ukraine okay. um, because the part of Poland where my grandfather grew up is now in Ukraine. Okay. And we only had to go about 20 miles over the border. But again, it was fascinating to go and see the land. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's gay. It's things that you never, you'll never forget. It was just uh, an amazing time, yeah. really. And what we've discovered from my mum knowing practically nothing to what we know now has just been wow. amazing. But again, like I say, without the internet and all the records and things, you know, 25, 30 years ago, it was so much more difficult. How long did it take between having that phone call for the first time with your mother and your grandfather to having this reunion in Gdansk? We went out to Gdansk. I think that that was three or four years after we met him, I think. Okay. But he was living in Bristol and we spoke to him and within a few weeks we went down to Bristol and met him and his other children <laughs> and whatever. So that all happened quite quickly. Okay. Had he been back to Poland very much? He had been back to Poland two or three times, not many, but he had been back. Okay. And also his father, so my great grandfather after World War II, he went to live in America. Sadly, his first wife died in Siberia. But my great grandfather fought at the Battle of Monte Cassino with my granddad's brother. Okay. And my great grandfather married an Italian girl and they went to live in um, America and I actually then found out that they'd had a, a son so my granddad actually had a half brother okay so there was other angles and aspects to the story which developed as well that's quite a lot of things that you've uncovered yeah from being able to break through that kind of 
barrier of the adoption process. So yeah. that's that's really impressive. Did did your mother always know that she was adopted or was that kind of later on that she learned it? No, my mum always knew from when she was very young that she was adopted and okay. I always remember growing up that we knew as well that yeah. my mum, you know, I don't remember having ever been sat down and told we just always knew. So yeah. um and did she have any idea that she had this kind of Welsh and Polish ancestry or was that all a a complete surprise as well. I think she knew a bit about the Welsh side on her mother's side, but the the Polish side, I don't think she knew so much about. Okay. It was only when regulations and rules changed and if you were adopted, you could access certain information from your file. So Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure exactly when she found out that her father was Polish. She knew that before I started doing the research. Oh, okay. But I'm not quite sure when, when she found that out. It might have been when from when she got the original paperwork. And have you ever traced the the Welsh part as well as her mother's side? Yes, I've done quite a bit on the on the Welsh side as well and I've been to the villages in North mm-hmm. Wales where my grandmother and her parents lived and cemeteries etc mm-hmm. and I actually found a distant cousin on that side a few years ago my mum and dad and myself went to meet this cousin and okay. and also through having the done the DNA test on ancestry in the last few years I've actually had links come up on the DNA to both the Welsh side and the Polish side so I did chuckle when the DNA results came up matching the Polish side because although I'd done the paperwork and the paper trail (laughs) and everybody said that they were connected the DNA actually proved it and found another link to the family and a member of the family that had gone to live in New York and America so uh the DNA backed everything up, so that that was good as well, <laughs> and found some new leads. That, that's uh, always good when when the paperwork backs the DNA up, really. Yeah, um, yes, because uh, so many times it doesn't. Yeah, that's really impressive. I guess you've got lots of cousins in various different places in Europe and Canada and the US. Then yes, yeah. Yeah, I've got I've got relatives all over. As I say, my grandfather's family was split after World War Two. Yeah, of course. So there's um, relatives in Canada, America, uh, Poland. Um, yeah, it's all over. That's uh, a very exciting genealogy and DNA discovery. And sadly, we lost my grandfather five years ago. Oh. But a few years before that, we actually were down in Bristol with him. Mm-hmm. And he had on the wall, he had some his father's Monte Cassino medal and some other medals okay. framed in a frame with a photo of my great grandfather. And he suddenly took it off the wall and he gave it to me. <gasps> and I have that. And that is one of my most treasured possessions. And uh, I bet. he gave that to me, he said, because of my love of history, yeah. reuniting him with my mum. And that just shows really the relationship we developed in those 15 20 years that we knew him we got to know him very well so it was uh, we had a very positive and good outcome that's uh, quite a an emotional ending I guess for for that for him to to pass that to you definitely well thank you very much for sharing his story but I think it's time for you to face the brick wall Oh, brick walls. Who invented those? Yes, those research dead ends often caused by missing, lost, destroyed or just never kept records can be so annoying. But demolishing them can be absolute bliss. With that in mind, it's time for my guests to share one of their brick walls in a hope that one of you, dear listeners, might just have that crucial research clue or idea. So, Simon... What can we help you with? Well, my brick wall involves my great grandmother on my father's side. Okay. So her name was Edith Rosa Sinclair. Yeah. And I know her age when she married and I know her age when she died, but I could never find her birth certificate. Okay. I then found a birth certificate, which was 10 years earlier than (laughs) her age has indicated. Okay. (laughs) So (laughs) So I ordered a copy of that birth certificate. Yeah. But I was never quite sure if it was the right one. Okay. Then the 1939 registers became available, which actually gave the actual date of birth. Mm-hmm. And Edith Rose's 
date of birth was the 5th of November. Right, okay. The birth certificate that I had ordered from 1881 actually was for the 5th of November, 1881. So that's looking good with a match. That's looking good. The mystery, though, is on that birth certificate, her father is named as William Henry Sinclair, Mm -hmm. and her mother as Clara Martha Sinclair, formerly Boys, B-O-Y-S. I've never been able to find a marriage for Clara Martha Boys and William Henry Sinclair. Okay. I was able to find that Edith Rosa Sinclair had a sister that was born in 1868, Alice Clara. And on that birth certificate, as well as the 1881 birth certificate, the address is Free Garden Row, Kennington. So they are a match, those sisters. But on the birth certificate for her sister... The father is named as William Henry Poulet, okay. P-O-U-L-E-T-T, a gentleman. So I have a William Henry Poulet in 1868 and a William Henry Sinclair in 1881. William Henry Sinclair in 1881, his occupation was a lamp maker. Mm-hmm. So moving on from that... When Edith Rosa Sinclair married in 1915, she named her father as Edward Sinclair, deceased, who was a commercial clerk. (laughs) So I have three different names. And I say I've never been able to find a marriage for Clara Boys and William Sinclair. But when Clara Sinclair died in 1902... She's actually shown as the widow of Edward Sinclair, a solicitor's clerk. It's all a bit of a mystery. My goodness. When you told me the the father's names on Edith and Alice's birth certificates, and you said that they were both called William Henry, but different surnames, I just thought, well, maybe Clara just liked to date men called William Henry. <laughs> um, but this is just a complete mess. <laughs> it is. It is. And um, yeah. The 1868 birth certificate with William Henry Poulet, a gentleman, Mm -hmm. I did some internet searches and there was a William Henry Poulet who was from quite a well-known family in London. Mm -hmm. So whether Clara Martha Boys was a a servant or worked in a big house and something happened, but then again, I would have thought it was quite unusual for the gentleman's name to be on the birth certificate because quite often it would have been left blank. Yeah, that. That is unusual. There's quite a gap between Alice and Edith yeah. as well. Yes. So that that might, obviously it might not, but it might support that maybe Clara and this gentleman were the parents of Alice. Yeah. And then later on, she meets Mr. Sinclair, has Edith, yeah. and they marry. And, you know, that kind of brings the family together. I guess that could be a possibility, but... Yes. It does seem very suspicious. It does. Particularly with Edward being thrown in. Yes. And and like I say, I can't find a marriage registration for Clara Martha Boys to uh, Sinclair with either Edward or William Henry as the first names. So that that is that is my mystery. Um, And also I've done my DNA testing, which has brought up links, like I said earlier, to my Polish family, my Welsh family. Mm -hmm. But I've had nothing come up so far that has linked into that side of the family. So it's all a bit of a mystery. It's annoying, but their absence is also quite tantalising as well. Yeah. <laughs> is, it, is it just that people haven't tested or is it that you're not going to get any matches because there's no one else that's going to match? Yeah, that is that is a puzzle. So you've got Edith with the correct dates of birth in 1939. That matches her birth certificate on the 5th of November 1881, but the father's surname is different from her sister. Yeah. And then Edith doesn't give the same first name for her father in 1915. Uh, When she married in 1915, she said it was Edward Sinclair deceased. And I've tried to find an Edward Sinclair that died before 1915. But again, I can't link that in. And when she married in 1915, she's saying that she was 25, the same age as the groom was 25. From the birth certificate, I believe she was 35 and he was 25. But she carried on that different younger age right through because even her death certificate 
she's 10 years younger than she would have been if we use that birth certificate that I found from 1881. Yeah, so she's consistent with this 10-year difference. Yes, and I say if the actual day, the 5th of November, if that had, hadn't matched exactly with the 1939, I might have said, no, that's not the right birth certificate, but it was too much of a coincidence yeah. to not be the link, I think. Quite a knotty puzzle. If, let's imagine that you had, say, access to, like, I don't know, time machine or something, and uh, you went back in time to a particular date and a particular place to kind of find out for yourself, what place and date do you think you'd pick? I think I would go back to 1880, 1881, around the time that Clara was with William Henry Sinclair, whoever William Henry Sinclair was. Assuming he actually existed. that. <laughs> Or existed, yeah. It was called, well, he existed, but, but whether he was called that. Yeah, that'd be interesting to find that out. Um, is there a way that maybe listeners could contact you if they think that they have a research idea or a clue? Uh, yes, I mean, I have my own Charmwood Genealogy website. I have my blog or I have uh, an email address, which is charnwoodresearch at virginmedia.com. And people can contact me through any of those avenues. Okay, well, we'll put links to those in the show notes for this episode. But of course, listeners can go to familyhistoriespodcast.com and then use our contact form and we'll send that message straight over to Simon. So um, my fingers are crossed for this one because it looks like an absolute mess. (laughs) I've got my toes crossed as well. (laughs) (laughs) Don't fall over. (laughs) Um, so while the listeners go looking for clues it's just about possible that i might be able to help you with this but you're going to need to follow me through to the garage okay here we are oh wow what is all this this is my secret time machine really yes really this would make my job so much easier I don't doubt it would, but I thought you might like a little return trip back in time to see if you could solve the brick wall for yourself. That would be great. Just one trip, though. Now, where was your brick wall again? It's the 5th of November, 1881, in Kennington in London. Excellent. There we go. All set. What's that flashing blue button? What button? This one. No, don't press it. Style entity imminent. A what? A style entity? I can't deal with the Kardashians right now. Warning. Hostile entity imminent. No, no, no. no. I think I preferred the first option. What's going on? Warning. Hostile entity imminent. All right, all right. But what does that actually mean? What on earth is that? Oh, my giddy aunt. (laughs) 